So, uh, I'm Sudhir I manage part of the Cloud Platform team. Uh, not the build and deploy uh, management part, but the runtime architecture part. With me, I've got Nitesh, the author of quite a few of the Netflix open source components that uh, Adrian talked about, and a few other colleagues from Netflix are here as well, so that we can all network later and talk more deeply about what it is, uh, what Netflix is about, right? All right? Oh. Thank you. Uh, because today's talk is, uh, the focus is about microservices and not the cloud, so I'll just talk for the next five to 10 minutes about microservices. Um, when I joined Netflix back in the days, well, this is about 2008, it was a monolithic uh, web application. There was one, one application called Netflix.war, right? That was it. This was back in the DVD rental days, right? Um, and the idea was to make it vertically scalable to the extent possible. We paid a lot of money to various vendors to make that scaling possible. And then we migrated over to the microservices world. I um, can't quite remember when, but imagine it's around 2011-ish. And then, boy, how did we embrace microservices? Literally, from that Virgil the Bike kind of thing <laughs> to this mess over here. Um, so what we're talking today really are that there's some good positives of moving to microservices, definitely. But there are quite a few challenges. What are these challenges? And what tools are there to uh, take these challenges head on? That's what the talks can be. Obviously, the, the, the positives, one of the most important positives everyone talks about is velocity of development. Once you divide your application into multiple micro web services, the velocity increases. Fantastic, great. It also brings out like a federation of DevOps. In other words, you don't need a centralized team that manages a monolithic web application. Now, really, you have to change your culture so that every team that owns a microservice is their own product manager, their own engineer, their own QA, and their own system manager. They have to carry the pager duty as well, right? So it's not like a federated model. Now, that brings some challenges as well. So decentralized governance is what it is about. And that's a fantastic thing, but there are challenges there as well. Uh, so what are some of the challenges? Um, anyone here thinks that distributed systems are easy? All right, of course. Of course, it's super easy. I write two books on it uh, every week. Um, distributed systems are inherently complex. Uh, and when we talk about microservices, really, you are buying into distributed systems, whether or not you know that, okay? Secondly, operational overhead. When you've got one monolithic web application, you can hire a team of system administrators, right? And guess what? They will be very happy. They know the in and out of those, uh, that particular application, and it's all good. But when you have hundreds of microservices, if they all act, sound, smell, and look the same, that's fantastic. You can have a small system admin uh, team. However, if each one of your microservices are all acting different, and they smell different, for example, if one is a LAMP stack, another one is a Java stack, another one is a Groovy on this, can you imagine the complexity that your organization is going to have to embrace? All right, so that's what we um, And we all talked about versioning and service interface. I don't need to get into that. Suffice to say, it's a pretty complicated uh, <coughs> topic. I'll be happy to chat again after this talk. Um, testing. When you have a monolithic application, when you write JUnit test codes, it's very really easy. Why? Because everything is contained in that one application. But when you have to do testing, QA, in a, in a microservices world, you can't just test in isolation anymore. You need all of these hundred other jokers to come with you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's challenging as well. Um, and fan out of requests. So when you have a monolithic application, if you've got a zero, two, two billion requests landing on your monolithic application, at the end of the day, it's still two billion public requests. Then you have microservices. The edge application essentially has to talk to hundreds of microservices. So your two billion requests really fan out into 20 billion HTTP requests, right? So we're talking about massive scaling <laughs> needs here. Um, 
So let's talk about one of the claims of microservices, which is, hey, if you embrace microservice, it increases your overall availability. Is that true? Yes, I think so. Uh, I can tell you one thing. Uh, back in 2008 again, let's go back in time, there was one missing semicolon that brought down the entire Netflix website for almost half a day. Yes, a missing semicolon in a database brought down the whole entire website. You may ask, what if you're interested in how this happened, I'll tell you a small story. So the code is all fine, the data is in the database, some developer has written this wonderful token parsing logic that requires that the semicolon end the parsing. Some other developer decided to put some data there that did not have the semicolon. And now, every code that was trying to parse that, that data went into an infinite loop, chewed the CPU, Drag the services down. Your whole entire monolithic, remember the Burj Al Dubai thing there? <laughs> down, right? Half a day. So really, monolithic applications are not that good from an availability point of view, right? So, we introduced microservices, of course. So, let me ask a question here. If a monolithic web app, uh, service has a claim uptime of 99.99% availability, and if you have, instead, break it down into 30 microservices. Each, each of these microservices also claim 99.99 availability. What do you think is the overall availability of your website, of your system? Anyone? It depends, that is true. No, yeah, it depends. That can be true, but it depends. It actually goes up. It goes up? Right. Interesting answers, a spectrum of answers here. Um, let me talk about reality. Again, talking about monolithic web application comes in town. Even if you embrace monolithic uh, micro web services, do you think that one, one rogue microservice can bring down your entire website? It is possible. Yes. How? Imagine your edge applications, again, it depends, right? So if you got your edge service, which is then talking to 100 different microservices, uh, and you can think of Tomcat, Glassfish, WebSphere, whatever you have, as long as it's a threaded model that you're using, uh, as a request lands in your, uh, on your Tomcat thread, right? There are a finite amount of this, let's say 200. It's talking to various of these uh, dependency microservices. As long as they're green, they're good, you're up and fine. I see it really depends on how do you organize your uh, service, whether it's uh, both, both vertically or horizontally or somewhere in the middle. You're, you're absolutely right, but let me come to so thing about what is the Netflix uh, choice in terms of so your at Netflix, they've got one edge service, uh, which talks uh, to multiple hundreds of micro web services. But yes, it depends. So imagine now that there's a rogue dependency I microservice. service. Some bad developer that just joined, didn't write a good code. One, just one bad dependency. Right? What's going to happen in a threaded model is that a request lands in under the edge service, talks to that dependency service, goes for a loop. Right? It takes microseconds, literally, for uh, all 200 threads in a particular instance to be eventually talking to that particular dependency service, and that instance is gone. Yeah, you might have 20 instances. Eventually, all those 20 instances will be dead as well, right? So, yes, uh, the answer to my previous uh, question was, uh, the map, it depends on the layout, but for the layout that we have, which is one edge service with hundreds of different micro web services, in the case of 30 micro web uh, services, the uptime is 99.7%. It's better than the monolithic application, which is 100 or totally down and dead. So this is better, but it's not, it still could bring your whole website down. What's the solution? The solution is that you have to have fault-tolerant architecture. So by all means, embrace micro web services, but don't think you're done. Don't think, okay, well, I'm moving from monolithic to micro web services, so I'm good to go. Uh, you're good to go. Provided you also embrace fault tolerant architecture. Right. District. And 
Adrian talked about this. Uh, go to github.com slash Netflix slash Hystrix. That's one of the variants that we have that provides uh, guarding against this sort of uh, uh, what I earlier talked about. Service discovery becomes important. When you have a monolithic web application, you know who it is. It's Bob, and Bob's a monolithic web application. However, if you all have hundreds of micro web services, and like Adrian said with the guild group, from 450, it's 450 last week, it's 500 next week, 600 the next, right? How do you know who's coming up and what are they? You definitely need a service discovery. So again, we've got Eureka at Netflix that we use. Uh, Udaj is the mother of Eureka. Um, another interesting choice. Have you considered what your load balancing logic would be or architecture would be? If you have a monolithic web application, you just need one hardware width, perhaps, and you're good. When you have hundreds of micro web services, are you going to have 100 load balancers? Yeah? <laughs> That's going to be a nightmare. Um, so you got to think about other ways of load balancing. At Netflix, we have chosen client-based software load balancer. Um, Adam here is the author of Ribbon, which has client-based load balancer that is perfectly well-suited for a microservices architecture. Um, <coughs> So this uh, slide talks about uh, resiliency built into the smart load balancer. Over here, we've got three different Amazon uh, web service zones. And the smart load balancer is, uh, it it's understands latency, it understands zone affinity, it understands a bunch of uh, you know, variables that contribute into how it should load balance requests from the micro web services. Okay, tools of the trade. Adrian talked about, hey, if you want to disrupt an industry, don't look at the IT spend. Look at what the developers are doing. And he said it's a prime area for uh, innovation. I think Nitesh and our team, we should quit and do this too, because we have attempted to build just that. Right? So what you see over there is the app dynamics view of the Death Star. Not quite arranged in a nice little circle, but as a mess. Um, if you don't have good tooling, it's very difficult to deal with micro web services. When you've got an explosion of hundreds of micro web services, that's what you'll be looking at. And you have no idea who is who, who is talking to what, and who is dependent on what. Right? Really, it would be nice if it was somewhat like this. I've got an edge service. I know it's talking to this other service. I know it's dependent on two other services. Right? Furthermore, it's very important in terms of what Adrian said. You need to be able to monitor what's going on. You need to be able to understand that the latency from edge service to gateway is X, and the latency from there on downwards is Y. All of this becomes important. And so we did build such a tool. And uh, instead of the horrible dead style that you get to see, you can, in this particular case, uh, look at what it is that isn't this a better view compared to the previous one? Right? It tells you. Well, I should kind of go back. <coughs> there. This is a much better view because what it tells you is that there's an edge service there. It fans out requests into these other mid tier services, which further fans out requests onto these other tier services. And furthermore, you can click on these links and it can tell you how many services, uh, what are the, what's the call volume like? What's the distribution like? So tools of this nature become very important when you are dealing with micro web services. What's that one's name? This one's called SAP, and we have not open sourced it. Really? We're going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of asking Adrian to see if I could get that funded for uh, But maybe, no, we'll, we'll probably open source. So uh, what is the role of ESP in the age of micro services? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, well, uh, I guess the question is that as far as micro web services go, as uh, earlier somebody uh, said, there are different kinds of architecture. There's synchronous, there's asynchronous, there's message oriented architecture. So we can get About the enterprise service bus. Yes, I understood. Uh, but I, we don't do that at Netflix. So, in other words, the microservices that we use, we don't use an ESB. Uh, we don't use that pattern, but I know. I don't quite know whether it's 
Anyway, let me say not say which other company. There is one big company that does follow the ESP uh, pattern of microservices. I won't be able to talk about it because I don't quite know uh, how that works. So, the other part. To begin requests, because of the web services architecture, gets spanned into 20 billion requests. What does that tell you? That your network better be really robust, right? Uh, well, in the cloud, you don't have the choice. You can go to Amazon and say, well, give me a better network. That's cause you're in the public cloud, and you get what you get, right? You, there are constraints that you have to work with. So in that case, you just need to invest in a better architecture in terms of your IPC calls, right? What is that better architecture? I'll let you dish that. Uh, sorry for the trouble. Uh, I'm Nitesh. Uh, I work in the cloud platform team in Netflix, and of late I've been busy uh, re-architecting the IPC stack of Netflix. So, uh, before I start talking about what has changed in IPC 2.0, uh, let's let's see as to what is the current state of IPC. Uh, just so that I know my audience, uh, how many of the people um, are aware of IPC stack and how IPC works inside Netflix. Pretty sure of them. Not bad. Okay, uh, but I guess I need to at least tell us about how it stands for the starters. Uh, so how it works is essentially this is your IPC picture uh, inside Netflix. On your left hand side, it's the client side of the IPC. On the right side, up on top, it's the server side of IPC. And uh, and, and doing all the magic in between as to how the client knows the server is essentially the Eureka, which is the service discovery of Netflix. Uh, how it goes is that since um, uh, Sudhir touched upon initially as to it's a monolithic, uh, it's not a monolithic application and it's like 400, 500 microservices that is deployed in the architecture, you need to know as to, you, you can't have every other client know as to what their uh, servers are. In, in, in a nutshell, you need to have a central discovery service, which will tell you if you want to talk to a particular microservice, where do they belong? And that's that's the role Eureka has, which is open source as Eureka. Uh, the client side of things are open source as Ribbon in Netflix, uh, and Ribbon being the the lower level of of the client, it is essentially the transport layer as we call it. On top of it, in order to make any serious clients. With, with all the resiliency built in, you would possibly have Hystrix, which is which we touched upon as a fault tolerant layer. Uh, then there is some best practices that we follow that, okay, uh, let's not call our service, services for every call that we make, and if there is cacheable data, let's cache in EVCache. And EVCache is a thin layer on top of Memcache that we have open source. Um, so this being the architecture, what it really means is that since Ribbon, Ribbon uses as a transport layer an open source Apache HTTP client, and on, on the server side we have primarily Tomcat, it means that the only thing that we can talk about on the protocol is HTTP, both are HTTP, we are tied to HTTP. Uh, and over time what we have seen is that, although it was good to start with, but there are, there are multiple, multiple people who are interested in different protocols, and this, this stack really doesn't cut it. Uh, all over the, the most uh, interesting piece of this architecture is that it's a blocking architecture. And over our benchmarks, uh, we have seen that it's not really the best way to scale your services. So what has changed in 2.0? Uh, the basic thing being that we were using Apache HTTP client and Apache Tomcat is being replaced by a new library called Rx Nady. Uh, Nady being a very established and uh, uh, well-tested, hugely adopted networking library. 
uh, and it and it works on uh, a future-based model for asynchronicity. And it, if people have really uh, worked on really asynchronous applications, they quickly realize that if you are not a very simplistic callback, one callback at a time model, it becomes a callback hell to deal and compose different calls over over your network. So, uh, so we being aware of it and at our edge services, we knew that okay, uh, the the callback model will not work. So what we ended up doing is that we created reactive extensions to Nelly, which is marrying Rx Java with Nelly, and that's an open source library that we have we have recently open source. Uh, since since Nelly is a networking library which by default gives you multiple protocols, what it got to is instead of HTTP, you can do multiple protocols from a lower level uh, transport protocol like TCP and UDP to a higher level application protocol like HTTP, WebSocket, SSE. And, and we start to cater to people who are who were quite much restricted because of our IPC stack, only handling HTTP. And the biggest win of this architecture is it's a completely asynchronous architecture. And I'll, I'll get into the next slide as to why this is better. But this is the biggest win of the architecture, essentially. That's a quick question. Yeah. So uh, the old school model, like war and everything, I, I'm guessing did it kind of go away in this. I'm a big fan of defense injection, sort of do stuff like that. Is that what's going on with the uh, server side here? Oh, yeah. Right, so right below in Rx Netty, yeah, how do you get the, the binding? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, Rx Netty is the lowest layer, and, and what we have on top of it is carry on and ribbon, okay. and both of them are uh, DIO pair. Oh, so, so you can you can actually use it. Uh, so generally, when start people when people start talking about asynchronous architecture, uh, they they usually start benchmarking as to whether it it really applies to them or not, whether moving to Netty or a completely asynchronous networking library will will apply to them. And and the biggest mistake people do is that okay, if if I were to use Netty, I have hundred clients with a with an RPS of X X X, and and that's what I have to see as to how much how much RPS or how much concurrent clients can my server handle? So the biggest difference in between between benchmarking this and and a true microservice architecture is in normally in a microservice architecture your uh, application is not bounded by any more requests. Typically, you know, in, in our architecture, what will be that you you will be calling multiple other services to 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 get your data, and and the biggest bottleneck what it turns out to be in a blocking architecture is the client side. And, and that's what we, we benchmark, uh, rather than benchmarking typical Hello World uh, benchmarks that are, that are there all over the web. What we have benchmarked to, to gain insight into whether it's better or not is, is our own um, project called WS Perf Lab, which is again in our, in our GitHub uh, organization repo. Uh, you can go look at it, but, but what we have seen is that instead of benchmarking Hello World, benchmark actual microservices calls. And what we have, and what we actually figured out is that it's it's not the inbound, in it's the outbound that is that is troubling. So so if you look at a typical uh, architecture inside an application, what happens is that for a Tomcat or a blocking container, there is a thread per connection. So every time a new connection is established, there's a thread dedicated to it. Uh, that thread usually runs through the application code, and then since since at the outbound you want fault tolerance, you really don't want to block the outbound thread. You have a queuing point, which is Citrix for us, and that introduces a, a set of threads per client. Now multiply this with the number of dependencies you have. Your thread pool or the number of threads that you have on the outbound side is directly proportional to the number of dependencies. So what kind of protocol, synchronous protocol, you are using? It's HTTP right now. To me. It's SSH. HTTP. HTTP? You're talking about protocol or? Yeah, like handshake or whatever, because when you're talking about synchronous, there's a way to synchronize a different kind of service. No, uh, this, is is an an okay. this is inside an application. What? This is inside an application. This is not a cross network application. Uh, so, since I mean, since uh, Sudhir and Adrian also touched upon as to how do you make your services fault tolerant per client when it is blocking, you have a queuing point at this place which, which decouples your inbound to outbound. Uh, so, number of number of clients that you have multiplied by the number of threads you have in any strict school give you the number of threads that you would eventually get. This is what you're selling as the number of incoming connections increase, your number of threads inbound connector increase, 
and it is proportional to the number of connections that you can handle at your uh, application flow. Large number of connections, large number of external dependencies, tons of threads. And just to give a perspective, our edge services run through around 1,400 threads. A little bit of detail as to how this works in an asynchronous application. What really changes is if you look at it, in the initial slide, there is a thread per connection. In the, in the asynchronous world, there are multiple connections per event loop. And uh, for statistics, you can have thousands of connections per event loop. Uh, but as soon as you get a connection on a server, it re gets registered to an event loop. And that event loop processes it till the time you get to the outbound event loop. And there can be thousands of connections per event loop. The events loop are shared between in and out. So theoretically, you can have four threads servicing 400 requests per second or 10,000, 20,000 clients, depending on the workloads that you have. Uh, there is history still there because uh, you want to throttle. You don't want to have a queuing point for gaining asynchronicity because your networking is asynchronous. But you have a, 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 a throttling point, which is history. And if you look at it, the number of connections really doesn't increase the event loops. You have 10,000 connections, you have four event loops all over the system, which means you have four event, four threads in your system, which, which essentially means that the request that is inbound is processed till the time it goes outbound. It's the same thread that holds the data. You have a lot of positive around cache localities on processors and simplicity around thread changes and other and based on our benchmarks, it's, there is a huge difference between the two. You really, I mean, the, the number, the throughput that you get is double of what you can get from a blocking uh, So, not much time to get into details, but we, we will be uh, publishing a blog post soon as to what we have found out based on our benchmarking for microservices. Uh, key takeaways, microservices is definitely a better compared to monolithic apps, but it is, it is not so simple. Beware of the challenges, don't reinvent the loop. Uh, don't reinvent everything that, that we have done for you. Go to github.co, netflix.github.co, see, see what, it, uh, what, what you can benefit from this. Thank you. Oh, any timelines on when you release an IPC to Oh, uh, so the release candidates are, are out now. Uh, you can use RX90, you can use Ripple and Carry On, which is built on top of RX90. But they are release candidates, we don't, Currently use it in production. We are testing them out. So take it to the pitch as well. Can I just follow that? Okay. Yeah. So a traditional model like Jetty and all that sort of libraries, which are pretty you know easy to test and all the right, uh, does that sit under your RX Jetty pretty easily? Uh, is a question that I don't like why in a traditional world, I don't even argue it's too traditional, but the Jetty or the Jackson sort of stack to kind of get them all woven together for free. Oh. Okay. I would like to not lose all the Jetty piece um, Jackson. I'd like, to get, I'd like to swap our, go from Jetty to RX Netty and not lose everything else. Below. Great question. I think uh, the question uh, is basically do I, when I go to RX Netty and carry yeah, yeah. on with the 2.0 world, do I lose the, the flexibility that I get from Jersey creating applications? Yeah, yeah. And it's an awesome question. Basically, uh, if you're writing server side applications, having hand coding your routing logic that this URI goes to this resource is a pain. So, uh, so that's why Carryon provides a Jersey extension okay. on top of RX90. Uh, it is, again, it is a release candidate. We are working on it. Okay. We'll soon be getting out a 2.0 version, uh, Jersey 2.0. Carryon? Carryon is the service. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you.